You're listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I got to tell you something, people. Today, I treated myself, and my message to you is always to treat yourself. Whenever I shave my head, because I'm bald, except on the sides, I buzz it like every two weeks, I leave a mess, Joanna comes home, she's like, you know, you left whiskers in the sink. So I was driving by a place called Great Clips, so I knew it had to be good. And they had haircuts for $7.99, so I went in, and I got it, and I feel great. So remember, always treat yourself. Anyway, we have a great show today. My guest is such a good actor. You know, he just blew me away. I just I just watched The uh, Deuce, and he just blew me away. And you've seen him in The Wire, and you've seen him in True Blood. And I'm three years older than him, but my birthday is two days after his, so we're both Scorpios. And my guest is Chris Bauer. How you doing, Chris? I'm good. That was nice to, uh, that was a nice description there. Guess I've done some work. You've done amazing work. It's so funny. It's like you're one of those guys that is such a good actor. Now, but I want to ask you, I was talking about treating myself. You you work a lot. Do you ever just take time to treat yourself and do go out of your way to do something special for you? Yes, I try to do that once every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. Honest to God, uh, I'm a worker. And I get... First of all, I feel so grateful and so blessed that I get to do what I love, you know, and have now for three decades, that I don't have a huge appetite for, um, you know, taking care of myself in a way that, that, uh, that's separate from that. But also I have kids, you know, I got two teenagers, they're up and out of the house now and in college and between work, kids, I've been married for 23 years. Almost all my gratification comes from providing for them and trying to be a better dad, better husband, better artist. But I guess um, the closest thing for me is I surf. Okay. And I try to get in the water, you know, ideally once a week, twice a week. And that's definitely time I have a bunch of friends who I surf with, sometimes alone. But that's definitely a time when uh, I just feel like I pop the, you know, I sort of open the fuel tank and just fill it up with uh, some of those deeper kind of soul vibes. And that's all for me. So, yeah, I do, that's how I do it. Well, you're, you're a Cali guy, and that's probably where the surfing came from. Um, when, when did you start getting interested in acting? Well, you know, I was always interested in acting the way any kid raised in front of a television is interested in it. You know, like my earliest, my, my earliest sensation of like, uh, being outside of myself was like watching the $6 million man, Lee Majors and the $6 million man and thinking like, or the Brady Bunch, or there was this old cop show called Emergency. And um, I, my manager was just calling me there. Um, anyway, um, and I just remember thinking, God, I want to be in that world. There was a show called Moving On. It was Claude uh, Aiken and Frank Converse, and they were truckers. And as a kid, what I wanted to be when I grew up um, changed with whatever show I liked. So I wanted to be a paramedic. I wanted to be a cop. I wanted to be a trucker. And then by the time I got to be a teenager, I realized the one thing all those had in common was they were actors playing those parts. So I think it kind of slowly grew from that place. And there's this other weird circumstance, which is I got my SAG card uh, right around my fourth birthday because growing up in L.A., we lived in the San Gabriel Valley, which was, you know, nowhere near Hollywood, but my mother, she thought I was cute. So she got me an agent as a kid. And I would go to these auditions for commercials, the occasional, you know, guest star part on a TV show. And I was way too young to understand it and certainly way too young to elect to do that myself. Um, but she, she, she 
she got me into it. So I'd go to these auditions. I did a bunch of commercials and things like that. And I absolutely hated it because I, I didn't <laughs> understand what I was supposed to do. You know, it's like the early 70s and it was kind of pre-kids uh, or people too vibes. <laughs> so I'd walk into these rooms um, not really knowing why I was there. And all these mostly men at the time, you know, hippies and denim sort of be like staring at me and I and I just I slowly intuited that like if I made a funny face or if I said something cute they would laugh and I and I built this sort of sense of behavioral vocabulary based on their response um, to figure out how to get jobs and when I got a job made my mom happy and I usually got a skateboard <laughs> so so that went on for like, you know, five, six years. And then um, I, I, I finally just kind of got old enough to say, I don't really like this. You know, I, I, it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me anxious. I don't want to do it. And I stopped. But I think that laid a groundwork of some, you know, some foundation of a professional world um, that served me later. I mean, it hindered me and it served me later. So I only mention that just because, though I don't think it has anything to do with acting, unlike some people, I did have some exposure as a kid to the fact that there was a business, there was this entertainment business, so at least it was a real thing. And I think that, um, and I think that was a bit of, of an advantage for me later when it came time to, you know, pursue my career on my own. And and you had your side card, so you know you already got you already got to step up on people. Yeah, here's a little uh, scoop for you. Scoop. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I got my so my my legal name is Mark Christopher Bauer, and when I got my SAG card, obviously it was Mark Bauer. Later, when I was I think I was twenty, when I dropped out of college and started to go back to acting school and pursue this, you know, as a vocation. For some reason, I didn't want to be Mark anymore. So I called SAG and I said, um, you know, I want to catch up on my dues and I'd also like to change my name from Mark Bauer to Chris Bauer, which was the most random, impulsive, <laughs> worse than a tattoo with your girlfriend's name on it, move. <laughs> Because, you know, not only have I been Chris Bauer since then, but along the way, I mean, I can't, I must have met at least six Chris Bowers <laughs> who are actors. Well, that's like my name, Steve Cooper. Everyone's like, hey, we know Steve Cooper. I'm like, yeah, I know there's thousands of us. Yeah, it's like, I, but I chose that, you know, <laughs> my great coworker, Kristen Bauer, um, <laughs> there's, you know. There's some a bunch of people, theater actors, Chris Bauer, Christopher Bauer, the stuff you know. There's a guy named Chris Bowers. I feel like it's the muses keeping me humble, <laughs> which, you know, they have to do. Now, now, you said you dropped out of college. Was that at USD? Yeah. Now, what was your major when you went there, and, and when did you drop out? Well, I got recruited to play football there, and I wasn't a great student in high school. Um, good enough, but not great. I didn't take it very seriously. And my brain is sort of a right angle kind of brain. It's not like uh, straight lines are hard for me. And um, But because they recruited me, and it was by the beach, and it was really easy to uh, surf, I went, I agreed to play football, um, but I quit the first day. <laughs> I was so arrogant and so lazy. I was young, too. I mean, that October birthday, that late October birthday, I, I started college when I was 17, and I was such an immature 17, you know what I mean? Um, and um, so I don't think I was thinking very responsibly about you know what I was going to do in college and 
so I didn't start off in a great place. And um, for the two, two and a half years that I was there, I really just kind of took whatever class seemed interesting, went to about half of them, but I did all the plays. I think I did my one and only musical while I was there. And it was a very small theater department. I kind of worked my way through it, you know, in those two years. And the writing was on the wall. I, you know, I, I just wasn't doing well in class. I wasn't living uh, a very healthy lifestyle. <laughs> um, I just decided I got a bail and dropped out. And I moved. That was in a, that was in December. In January, I started um, acting classes at this place called the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which I saw in the newspaper or something. I guess saw an ad for it, and that started sort of climb up the mountain. Where you know, I realized that I, I you know. It's a hard thing to describe, but I, I sort of felt a sense of vocation, a sense of creative responsibility. And it was such a 180 from my experience in college where I never took anything seriously. And, you know, chaos and subversion was my sort of preoccupation in getting shit-faced. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And I'll never forget my first day at this uh, acting school. They gave us this, they were they were like, a lot of that stuff was like old school, Lee Strasberg, Stanislavski based, um, sense memory exercises and things like that, concentration exercises. And on the first day, the teacher said, all right, we're gonna do a little improv. Um, there's probably 15 of us in the class. And she said, okay, everybody get on that side of the room. All right. The floor of this room is filled with landmines. But if they're invisible, you can't see them. And you have to get across the floor um, without blowing up. And something happened. Like, I was, I think I felt like such a fuck up coming out of college. And I think I felt... It's almost like, you know, um, you're in a football game, you, you know, you're going to be in the game for one play, they're going to give you the ball, and you have to score. It was this intense sense of, like, now or never. So we do that exercise, and, you know, within two, three minutes, everybody's on the other side of the class and on the other side of the floor, and I like have moved like a foot and I'm hysterical and I'm in a complete panic and I'm a hundred percent convinced that the next step I take, I'm going to blow up. And it, 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 it was such a trip to, to sort of drop into this state of being that was different from the one that was me. And it was fully emotional and physical, and it was real, man. And I made it to the other side of the room, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> and this teacher was like, see that? And she pointed to me, and, she, you know, and I'm a scrub. Like, I think I maybe had just turned 20. I have the self-esteem of, like, uh, you know, an aunt. And she goes, see that? And she points to me and she goes, that's what commitment looks like. And it was kind of like the first compliment I ever remember getting. And I just felt, I just felt this enormous rush of gratitude that maybe I was born with an ability to do this thing called acting. And it has nothing to do with my personality has nothing to do with my intellect. It turns out, of course, those things are involved, but it was like, maybe this is just something I can do. And from that moment on, dude, I dug in so deep. It was like art was the parent that I never had. And I just was being raised 
you know, with this, this new sense of ethic and value and creative commitment and discipline. And, and I don't know, without that, I definitely wouldn't be here. Now, you know, you, you know, you, you, you got that ethic and you felt special. How did that help you get into Yale? Because, you know, that's, that's a big ass school. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good story. I, you know, it's one of many um, interventions from a benevolent, creative council of angels that have looked after me pretty much since that day. But, you know, after going to that school for a while and realizing that not only was this what I wanted to do for a living, but I wanted to do it well and I wanted to do it responsibly and I wanted to be trained you know, the way a plumber or a mechanic or a surgeon, anyone who's an expert in their field, I, I wanted to be trained that way because it just felt like the only way to honor the impulse, whether I worked a day in my life or not. So I started to explore these programs where you could get your master's and there was, you know, this is late 80s, um, Juilliard, you know, and I don't know anything about these things. I just kind of started to research it, and in the glorious pre-internet days, that meant, like, you either called the place or wrote them a letter, and they sent you a catalog. <laughs> yeah, I know. We used to, uh, it's funny, when I applied for colleges, we would get the college uh, magazine back, and we would get our picture taken, and we would put, like, the college thing together with a fake ID and try to get in the bars so it looked like college ID. I'd probably try that too. Um, so, you know, I started to find out about Juilliard and ACT, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, and NYU. They all had Master of Fine Arts degrees in acting. And then I started to sort of, you know, I'd go... Around this time, I started going to plays any chance I could, and I'd you know, write letters to the actors in the plays or send a letter to the theater. I'd keep the programs. I'd, I'd memorize the, uh, the bios of the people. And I did start to notice that a lot of different people had this training, this MFA training. And then every now and then, I'd come across something in, like, you know, the newspaper that mentioned the Yale School of Drama. And that that was, you know, where all these elite uh, killer actors went. And, you know, I'm third generation Southern California. And, like, I would just read Yale School of Drama and I would appreciate it for uh, being a symbol of that kind of excellence. But I never for a second even thought it was real because I had never even been east of, like, maybe Colorado. So I didn't even consider, plus I was a college, or a college dropout, so I just didn't even consider that as a possibility. But I started to audition for these different programs, spent a couple years doing that, and just got nowhere because I didn't know how to do it. Um, and it was all self-directed and, and kind of, you know, sussing out how it all works on my own. And, and um, after about two years, that sense that I wanted to train at a high level just grew and grew and grew, but the feedback was not good. <laughs> nobody, nobody was even really noticing me. Um, some of these places you'd go, you do a two-minute monologue, classical, two-minute contemporary, then maybe you get a call back, and maybe you're considered, and then maybe you're waitlisted, and just one after the next, I, you know, just got the, the first form rejection letter. And um, around that time, I just started taking more responsibility for my own growth. So what did that mean? It meant like spending a lot of time in libraries, reading plays, reading theatrical theory, history, anything that had to do with theater and performing arts. I like, I was a sponge and I stuck it up. And I, um, 
and I came across this. This sounds super boring, but the, the, the payoff's good, I think. Um, <laughs> came across this um, surrealist French artist named Antonin Artaud. And the idea that, like, um, you know, this all league left side offensive tackle three years later was reading Antonin Artaud. It's so beautiful to me. But this guy was crazy and he was an opium addict and he was a manic depressive and he left behind these, you know, poem after poem and manifesto after manifesto of what art can do for people and where it's coming from. And I just really connected to it. And I used to walk around with a little, um, little beat up paperback of his work in my pocket because throughout the day and night, anytime I could read what he wrote and feel like, uh, it was sort of a beacon, you know, it was like a, it was a lighthouse in terms of a direction for me. Okay, so, after auditioning for those programs for two years, I was kind of giving up. I was living in my parents' house, and I saw an ad in the paper for a play. This was in San Francisco. So I just went to audition for the play, like any other day. And I wait in line with everybody else. I go in, I do my audition, I finish and I just start heading to the door because that's just kind of what the pattern has been. And there was this guy in the room um, who was a friend of the director, I guess, that I was auditioning for. And as I'm heading to the door, he stopped me and goes, hey, can I talk to you for a second? I go, yeah. And he said, you're, um, you're interesting. Are you, are you interested in training? And I said, yeah, I went to this school, but I want to train some more. And I've been, you know, I just need to be done with programs and, but I'm not getting anywhere. And I don't know, but yeah, I really do. And he said, um, would you like to go to the Yale school of drama? And I was just like, did I just hear what I just heard? Like, is that a trick question? <laughs> and, and, um, he, uh, I said, well, yeah, but I dropped out of college. And he said, that's okay. Yale accepts people who don't have an undergrad degree um, in certain cases. I said, oh, okay. And he said, if I sent you an application, will you fill it out and, and return it? And I said, yeah, I will. So he did. I filled it out. A week later, I got uh, a letter saying you've been admitted to the Yale School of Drama. And I hadn't even applied. You know, it just sort of fell in my path. Now, here's what's so killer about this to me. Maybe 15 years later, um, maybe 20, after I had a career going and a life and um, and you know, things, things were working. I saw that this guy who um, I met in that audition that day was working at a theater down um, in Costa Mesa. And I drove down there and um, waited outside for him to come out. He came out and I said, you know, and he ended up being one of my teachers at Yale, so he'd seen me, but he said, what are you doing here? I said, what I'm doing here is thanking you for changing my life and just acknowledging that I understand how, how much of a difference you made for me and how far on a limb you went to sort of pull me from nowhere into the school like that. And I, and I want you to know that I try to do that for as many people as I can too. And he said, well, you know what? So what I remember about that day, I said, what? He said, um, when I asked you if you'd like to go to the Yale School of Drama, you took a step back and you turned in a full circle before you answered my question. And when you turned around, I saw in your back pocket, you had a copy of Antonin Artaud's essay. 
And when I saw that, it was done. You were going to get into Yale. And like, I, I don't know if anybody else gets it, but I still get chills from that because that book and that deep instinct that I had to explore all this shit that was way out of my realm of familiarity, but that spoke to me. And that book was like my totem along the way. And the fact that he saw that and he, and, and he made that connection and, and that that's what cemented the decision for him is just so beautiful to me. Well, and, yeah. No, I mean, it's amazing because you're right. And it's so funny. And, and so many times I do talk to actors that something so random or just something because they're really dedicated to their craft, but they'll get a break, which they wouldn't have gotten if they, you know, weren't, working like that showed that you were working and it's it was a book that a lot of people didn't know and it's just one of those things that as they call it kismet or whatever the timing was perfect yeah yeah, yeah. it's like you can't there's a perfection to it there's a perfection to the path and you can't take one piece out and replace it with something else like there was a lot of struggle on my way in you know like i didn't have i just didn't know how to get i didn't know you know, we finished Yale, and at the end of Yale, you go do a, um, like a showcase, you know, an audition thing. It's a very selective group, and because it's Yale and it's so hard to get into in the first place, generally, you leave there with an agent, and most of the people in my class left with maybe 10, 15 um, choices for an agent. I bombed dude I like nobody wanted to, one guy wanted to meet me after that it was a nightmare but that's kind of how it was for me early on it was just over and over and over um, these obstacles and these temptations to quit frankly well what what and can- I I say, what kept you? What kept you from not quitting? I think it's a combination of old school grit and honest acknowledgement of what they might be seeing. It's keeping them from wanting to bite. You know what I'm saying? Like. I, I had such a vocational sense of connection to this work that I knew it was pretty much the only thing I could do. Um, I really couldn't do anything else. And the grit of, I've always told people like, um, I'm really grateful when I grew up that I was much better at taking a punch than throwing a punch because getting hit and knocked down <laughs> it was really common, you know, physically, psychically, emotionally. Um, and so these obstacles would sort of present themselves and I would have the option, like, am I going to go down? Am I going to quit? You know, and it wasn't enough just to go, no, man, I'm going to, I'm going to transcend this. I'm going to overcome this obstacle. I had to also go, well, what am I doing? What's my part in this? What am I doing that's inhibiting people from getting me? You know, that was humbling work. Is that because it's like all the fake shit, all the fake bullshit that I was kind of bringing into the mix, having my shit together more than I actually did. Um, projecting my insecurities about how I look. You know, all this stuff. This sense of ignorance and bafflement that I was just kind of born with, which it turns <laughs> out is kind of a hallmark of all the characters that I play. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to try to cover that. Now... And, and think of, like it was a weakness. Now, so you, you're getting over that, though, and as you said, you know, you didn't quit... How did you, when you didn't get that 
you know, the recommend you got one person wanted to talk to you after the showcase. Where did you figure you'd go from your career? I mean, did, where did you go? I stayed in New York for a year and, you know, passed out flyers in front of uh, Tower Records by Lincoln Center for 50 bucks cash a day. Um, I temped as a security guard um, at an auction house on the east side. I got a polyester tux and worked as a cater waiter and did a lot of free readings, did one law and order. I got one audition that year and I got it. It was five lines on law and order. <laughs> so technically I was one for one, right. you know, but <laughs> that paid me 500 bucks, <laughs> which does not go far in New York City. Um, but what was happening was I was just, you know, meanwhile, peers of mine and people I knew were doing great. You know, they got these big agents, they're on Broadway. And I found myself comparing my, myself more and more and more to them. And after about a year, I felt like my, my, you know, sort of perception was so skewed and so kind of poisoned by my sense of comparison that, I had just lost any connection to a sense of um, personal, authentic investment in the work that I was doing. And so I learned a great lesson, a lesson that I bring with me in every single job to this day, which is if I'm going to have a truly creative experience, I have to let go of everything including any notions that I know what I'm doing, that I know what's going to happen, and um, start with a clean slate. So after that year, I left New York and I moved to Chicago and just got an apartment, found out there was, you know two or three agents there, put a picture and a resume in the mail, sent it out, and just started over from scratch. Now, did you start getting work when you got to Chicago? I was there for, uh, I don't know, two, three, four months um, before I got a play, and I got Richard II at the Goodman Theater. And um, and then a few months after that, I got cast in Clockwork Orange at Steppenwolf. And... More importantly, I was a year into approaching my work in a completely different way, which was, is this, is this bullshit? Is this vain artificial bullshit? Or is this simple, undecorated, make of it what you will, moment to moment work? And um, that was the first time I had really worked that way. And that town and the audience there, and in particular that play of Steppenwolf, Terry Kenny directed it, and he, um, he sort of, without knowing it, mentored me. <laughs> I really followed his example of um, grounded, you know, thorough, open-hearted approach. And I just rebuilt and within two years, um, I was doing another play at Steppenwolf. It was an adaptation of As I Lay Dying that Frank Galati directed. And I just went in uh, and I'd gotten one of the agents in Chicago and I made one of those tapes we used to make back in the early 90s where you put yourself on videotape and send it off to a producer and see whether or not you get it, which you never did. And it was for a film. And I got it. So two years later, I got, I was doing a play at Steppenwolf, made this tape for a part in a film, got cast in the film, and within a couple of weeks was on my way to Europe for the first time to shoot this movie called Snow White, A Tale of Terror, I think is what they ended up calling it. It was basically like a grown up version of Snow White. Um, with Sigourney Weaver and Sam Neill and, um, you know, making money 
which to me, I thought I was rich, you know, because I'd never made any. Right. Wasn't making much, but I was like, look out, look out. And after that movie, instead of going back to Chicago, I went back to New York two years later. Except now, it was like no one had ever met me. I was like Chris Bauer from Chicago. And went through the whole round of agents again, but this time they got me. They saw it. Isn't that incredible? Well, yeah, it's like they always say that. You know, I used to do stand up comedy, and they always said, you know, there was an opener, a feature, and a headliner. And they said, you can never become a feature in your own town until you went on the road and became a feature. And then they'd sit there and go, oh, okay, well, this person's more than just this MC. Yeah. Yeah, but, like, I, it was almost like I was a different person. It was almost like, tell us about yourself. Well, I, I just moved here from Chicago, uh-huh. And, like, none of that other shit existed. You know, like, a lot of these people had been at that showcase a couple of years before. A couple of the ages, a couple of them I'd met through, you know, friends and things like that. It was, I definitely think you get a different look when you're not the local. But there was just something so transformative about those two years that, um, they saw something fresh and I think I was able to bring something fresh. And what was fresh about it is that it was real. You know what I mean? Like I believed it. So, so you moved back there and you said you believe it and it was real. And you know, it's something that you feel like you've been, you know, resurrected per se. What, um, now how does that enhance your career? What happens then? Do you start booking a lot of stuff or what, what happens? question because there's a lot of great like uh making of stories <laughs> but, you know you still at the end of the day gotta walk into a room with strangers and be the guy they pick right like so i got the agent i got the manager they got me the appointments but i was sort of faced with the same situation which was like well now how do i get a part and all I can say is I just brought the same simplicity and the same honesty and the same um, level of risk that I would take. And one by one by one by one, you know, I think my first thing was I got a guest star on New York Undercover where J.K. Simmons and I were like partners and we were bad cops. And I was like 95, maybe 96. And then um, a little part in uh, uh, Bart Freundlich's movie, Myth of Fingerprints, which was, you know, they were still making legit independent movies back then. And this was like a, you know, Julianne Moore, Bart, um, who was in that, Roy Scheider. And I just started getting a little momentum and there was, and I just didn't feel like as distracted by the kind of big picture shit. It was just like, who's the character? Okay. This is what I think the character looks like. And, and, and I really haven't stopped since, you know, like I'm a worker and, um, you know, that I kind of went film to film to film. Devil's Advocate, Face Off was around then. Um, Face Off is a good example of, like, the difference. I went in to meet the casting director for Face Off, um, and she said, what part do you like? And I mentioned this part that didn't have any lines. And she was like, wait, what, what part is that? I said, he didn't have any lines, but when I read the script, there's so many characters in there. For some reason, that guy stuck in my head. And she was like, okay, well, I want you to come back and meet uh, John Woo, the director. I said, I'd love to. Would you mind if I wrote a scene for that character since he doesn't have any lines, just so you guys could see maybe what he would be like? She said, no, that's, that's a good idea. 
So I went home and I wrote this scene about this character. A week later, went to go meet John Woo um, in a hotel, did the scene, left. And I didn't hear anything for like four months. And I thought, oh, God, that was I kind of overshot it there. Like, I, what am I doing writing a scene for a character that has no lines for the guy who's going to direct the movie? And out of the blue, I got a FedEx from Paramount with a face-off script in it. I look at this, I open the script, I start flipping through it, and my character, who had no lines, all of a sudden has, like, this whole escape sequence. Wow. And, and a couple of lines. <laughs> I called my manager. I said, I just got this script for face off. She said, I just got the call. You're getting the offer for that part. So how about that? It's just, that's insane. But once again, it's being assertive and, and sitting there and just being confident with yourself and knowing you're in it to act. You don't, you're not sitting there. I don't want to be the lead. You know, you sat there and you wanted mm -hmm. this part and it made a difference. And then you're at least creative enough and assertive enough to say, let me write the lines. But I think that wasn't, I think that was just for you. So you didn't look like a dope when you went in there saying nothing. That's a really good point. That is a really good point because the pragmatism of that is as creatively valuable as anything. You know, when you come from this place of, and I think this is why I have such a good groove with um, Pelicanos and David Simon with the juice and the wire and stuff. When you come from a place of what is required of me to make this thing as focused and as clear as it can be, not as good as it can be, not as interesting as it can be, but, you know, it's almost this, it's, it's, it's like this sort of uh, technician's approach where, you're not thinking about what you're going to get out of it. You're thinking about what is required of me to make this thing itself. And um, that is a skill. You know, people ask me about my career. It's like, I, I, you know, you and I discussed before we did this that I'm not the most comfortable with like an interview. And it's because I don't, think of a career I think of a the, the career I don't I didn't coin this but it's absolutely true the career is that thing that's behind me that I cannot see what I'm doing every day is fixing shit and supporting shit and helping and trying to um, deliver something that makes your thing as good as it can be and you know what I mean? Like, that's my identity. That's my trade. And the next job is always that. The next job is like, okay, what am I going to get to do here to integrate in this group where we're going to try to make something that ideally offers the most to the audience that sees it? Now, you, you just mentioned in that about David Simon and uh, George. How did you get involved with the wire? And did you did you know how long your season, how long you're going to be on, or how did that come about? Did they know of your work? Did David know of your work? He only knew of me because I auditioned for the pilot as McNulty <clears throat> way back when they were first in that show. At the beginning of that show, I had worked with Bob Colesbury, um, who was David's producer at that time. Um, I'd worked with him on 61, this HBO movie about the Yankees. And just like that guy who asked if I wanted to go to Yale, Bob, for some reason, was like, I see something in this kid. I like this guy. And he mentioned me to David when they were casting The Wire, so I went in to read for McNulty. And uh, didn't get it. Um, and... At the time, I was on this show, Third Watch, on NBC. So the next year, when the, when the second season of The Wire rolled around, um, I got a call saying, there's this part in the second season that they like you for. And I said, you kidding me? They said, yeah. Um, I said, what about Third Watch? Because I was a regular on that show. And um, they said, well, we'd have to try to figure something out. And at the time, it was sort of unheard of if you were a regular on a network show that you could kind of go away and do something for HBO and in fact I pretty much wrote it off that there's no way I could do it 
And um, my wife, bless her, who's always played this role in my life, she was like, don't be an idiot. Try to do both shows. And, um, you know, we, we, it took a lot of doing and it took a lot of negotiating, but Third Watch let me out to go do The Wire. The Wire offered me Frank's vodka. And by the time I um, got the first script, I read it. I had a panic attack, and I thought, I must have been so fat and hungover the day that I auditioned for David <laughs> a year ago or whatever it was. Because I think I was 37, 36, something like that, 2003. And I, I read that first script, and I'm like, Frank Sabaka, he's this guy who works on the docks. He's got a kid who's, you know, in his early 20s. And... Um, I was pretty anxious, you know? So when I went down to Baltimore, I took the part, we worked it out. I went down to Baltimore, and before I uh, before I went to go see David, I saw the costume designer and, and the hair people, and we did, you know, some stuff with my hair. I stuffed a couple things in my shirt so I looked a little bigger, put on some pants that were too tight, and then I went to see him, entirely because I thought for sure he'd fire me if he saw me. <laughs> Out of, you know, out of character. But, like everything else, I mean, there are so many steps of intervention along the way there that made it possible for me to do that role. A lot of people had to agree to things they don't normally agree to. And, you know, it's just several more items on my list of reasons to be grateful. And why I need to return the favor to whoever employs me. You know, with... I have to meet their generosity um, and the world's generosity and the muse's generosity by giving me these chances. I have to meet it with my own um, best every single time. Now... With, you, with The Wire, it's one quick, a quick question. What was it like being on the set? Because it, it ended up being icon, such an iconic show. But did you guys know, was it like, you know, as I always compare it to, let's say you're in the minor leagues and all of a sudden they call you up and you're playing on this dynasty, like you're on the Yankees movie the, with about with the Maris and Mantle. What is it like when you go into the, it's, it's the big leagues, man. Like The Wire was so iconic. Did you feel it when you were on the set, like, this is something special. I felt like this was something special because the scripts were so good and the actors were so good and uh, the sense of mission was so clear. And by that, I mean, not like we're going to make a great show. It was like, we're going to do really good work today. And, but in terms of like an awareness that the wire was the wire, hell no. You know, it was like that. It took so long for that show to sort of be seen for what it was. That first season came and went, and it had its fans, but they were, you know, few and far between. And so when we're shooting the second season, there was no sense of uh, onus, you know, to meet some standard other than. This script is immaculate from page one to page 60. Anything less than full embrace of who these characters are would be disrespecting the material. And the fact that he was in Baltimore was like, you know, it was like, uh, we might as well have been, you know, building a building. Because there's no Hollywood vibes, there's no, there's no sense of, um, you know, precious TLC treatment of anybody more than anybody else. It, it, that is a roll up your sleeves and get the work done atmosphere. And all of David and George's projects are like that. It's my favorite place for that reason. Um, so when we were shooting that second season, it was kind of liberating because nobody was, there was no standard to me other than the one that was on the page. 
And that's the only one that matters anyway. You know what I mean? So it was very uh, kind of un, unsullied by a sense of obligation other than just do, you know, do the best work you can. Now, now when you got done the, the wire, how did the industry, how did that change you in the industry standard? Did people start looking at you different or, you know, cause you, you go on from there, you just go into a shitload of work, but did sit there and people go, wow, this guy's really got the chops or, or were you just getting some parts that you were like, ah, okay, I'll, it's sort of, I'm not sure if I want to do this or where did you go from the wire? What, how did that affect your career? It took a couple of years. It took a couple of years. Like I'll, I'll never forget. I finished the wire. I think we wrapped that season in July of 2003 and I took a trip out to LA I was living in New York at the time and I took a trip out to LA in December the whole second season had aired and I met with a bunch of different uh, casting people and things like that and every single one of them said so what have you been doing and I said well I just did the second season of The Wire and they were like heard of it like no, nobody had seen it um, and it took about a year for it to start trickling back. And here's what I remember about shooting that season. Um, I had a two-year-old boy. My daughter had just been born. Very recent post-9-11 anxiety in the city, in the country. Um, Iraq invasion started. It's kind of the beginning of this sort of never-ending instability and chaos um, that's in the air. And I approached every scene, <laughs> I approached every scene in that script like, uh, you know, McGuire and Conseco that year they played for the A's where they were so roided up <laughs> That they were just, they were in the front of the box, and it was like they could get hit in the eye with a 100 mile an hour fastball, and they, they wouldn't even feel it. <laughs> it, was, it was like every scene, you know, if you pitched me, if you pitched it underhand, I was going to line drive it back to the throat. If you pitched it overhand, I was going to hit the ball so far you never saw it again. And I don't know where that was coming from, except that I think that that's what they wrote. That's how desperate that guy was. And, you know, it, it's 20, 17 years later. I've played a lot of great parts since then. But I don't know if I've played any that had that much meat on the bone. You know, so... Well, you've you've had played tons of parts. I know you had some series. I mean, you've been lucky where you've... You've, you've had series work. Like, some of the series, you know, didn't last real long like Tilt and Johnny Zero but you're, you're still working but as you're working and you, know, you look at your IMDB and you're constantly working and then you know you're sitting there and you're working and it seems then along comes you know True Blood which was a few years after did that arise because you were known to HBO because of, of The Wire or did that just someone recommend you for that part? Um, Alan Ball asked to meet me for that and he uh, just kind of came out of the blue. We went and had a cup of coffee in New York. And at the end of that coffee, he said, I'd really like you to do this show. And so that was 2007. And um, that's usually how it is for me. I mean, it was like that with The Wire. It was like that with True Blood. It's like that with The Deuce. Um, and it's interesting because I've always been confused. Like, I've been a regular on television pretty much every year since 2000. And I've squeezed in movies, a lot of plays, Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway, and sort of been nonstop. And I have this sense, and I mean this in the most plain way, that nobody knows who the fuck I am. And I guess that's a good thing because better to know the character than the actor. Right. 
but, know. But the funny but thing at the is, same time, go ahead. No, I was gonna say the funny thing is, you know, like in True Blood, there was such a. Uh, their fan base, you know, like, like there, that's one of those shows. The wire has a very, uh, dedicated fan base, uh, you know, true blood. They have a very, you know, it's a certain group of people that watch it. And I guarantee if you walk through one of those, if there was a vampire convention, people would swamp you because <laughs> they know who the hell you are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, some do, but I just feel like I am, you know, carpet bombed television over the last 20 years and I just think that I don't have a you know I'm just not a I'm not a like I'm not oriented very shrewdly uh, when it comes to business creative a creative context for being is where I'm most comfortable and I've been lucky to be able to stay in that but Um, it's, I think one, I think we have to keep growing. We all have to keep growing as people. And one of the ways that I'm trying to open up and grow is to try to understand business better, try to understand my industry. And in the same way that I was, um, you know, in those early days, no one could sort of see me, like the vision was blocked because I wasn't coming from this a very authentic place. There's a part of me that has so much judgment and so much kind of uh, latent resentment for show business that it is, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like, it's limiting. You know, but at 53, it is what it is. Well, yeah, but you, I mean, as I say, yeah. it is what it is, but you've constantly worked, and I like the deuce. You know, I, I, as I said, I hadn't watched that. It was one of those things, you don't know what you want to watch because there's so much stuff on TV, and when you're a few seasons behind, you don't know if you want to make that commitment. But then when I talked to George, I said, I got to watch it. And I watched the first season, and, and I was blown away. And your character really developed from the first season and got bigger and bigger. Was that because you showed up to the set, you had the chops, and they said, we want to write more for this guy? I would like that to be true, but um, who knows, you know? I mean, those guys, they take on so much. You know what I mean? Like, they wrote a show about the city of New York as a proxy for the United States. It's pretty hard to parcel that out into a few characters. <laughs> so they had so many characters and so many mouths from which to tell their story. Um, but they are incredibly good to me. And but with both George and David, I pretty much have a, a shorthand where I don't participate, I don't advocate for anything other than how to make the character as good as it could be in that scene. You know what I mean? And they get to do what they do, and I get to do what I do. And whatever form it takes is the right form, as far as I'm concerned. Now, so, now, was it hard to smoke? I don't know if you're a smoker in real life, but your character smoked a lot. Yeah, I used to be a smoker. I mean, I was like a half ass smoker. Um... <laughs> But that shit gets uh, old, those herbal cigarettes. Because I also, you know, we did, I was a chimney in the deuce, and then um, in between second and third season of deuce, I shot 10 episodes of this Apple show for all mankind. And I was NASA, I was playing Deke Slayton, who was an astronaut, and so for the first few episodes of that, everybody's smoking like crazy too. And finally I was like, I can't do this anymore. Even though it's just herbal or whatever it is, like it's just, you know, you just start feeling like it's just a TV show. Right. Somebody else smoke, you know? <laughs> the deuce also, I got to ask you, 
because, you know, I'm a bald guy, and I've never... What was it like when they... Did they come up to you and say, hey, in, in the second season, you're wearing a hair piece, and what was that like? Did you keep it on after the show, or did you just go into makeup, have it on, and then take it off? Dude, are you kidding me? You saw that thing, didn't I, you? I mean, yeah. it, looks like, it, it looks like it should have its own cage and, and you know, food dish at the, at the end of the night. We... George and I sort of had that idea simultaneously, and it came from Bobby. Bobby just getting so far away from who he was before any of that business started that he's doing anything he can to try to uh, keep from looking inside. So the wig is sort of an attempt to like look younger <laughs> and hip. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And it was it was really hard to find a toupee that could be bad enough to tell that story that this guy is desperate, but not so bad that he'd have to be insane to walk out the front door with it on his head, you know. And I wore that thing with pride, man. I was because he would have, you know. Well, there is one yeah, scene. There is one scene where uh, Franco goes to grab for it, and you get all pissed off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love that. That's one of my favorite moments in the whole show. Now, you said you'd have played Deke Slayton, Deke Slayton, you know, and you've played some other uh, real people, like in the uh, show about OJ and different stuff like that. What is it like when you play something, someone real? Like, because you're you're an actor's actor, you're a working actor, you work hard, you're into the craft. What is it like when you have to play someone real? Do you study that person at all? Yeah, I mean, I study that person to the point where I feel like I can, uh, you know, responsibly articulate who they are as I understand them, and most importantly, who they are as they exist in the script because nine times out of ten how somebody exists in a script and exists in real life are um, pretty essentially dissimilar and um, in the case of people who have like lived lives that are extraordinary and have made extraordinary contributions like Deke Slayton and I would say um um Oh, Jesus, who did I play in OJ? Tom? Tom Lang. Um, yeah, Tom Lang. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I personally feel a responsibility that, like, they look, at least to themselves, like they're in virtuous pursuit of what matters to them. Um, but in this day and age, there's a lot of... It's really hard. Like, productions don't encourage access to people who you're playing, especially if they're still alive, which which is a drag. I mean, it's it's I don't, it's a shame, but it's above my pay grade, you know? So, because um, ideally, you actually spend some time with the people. Um, but I always feel concerned that I play someone who, you know, lived or is living in a way where their legacy isn't exploited or taken advantage of for the sake of, um, you know, story opportunity. So I do feel an extra sense of, of uh, responsibility there, but quite frankly, hard to detect more responsibility between them and the fictional ones because as far as I'm concerned the fictional ones are real too you know they're just they're, they're, they're still souls flying through the ether I just give them a body at that time and they I try to advocate for the fictional souls as much as I would for the real ones um, because at the end of the day it is a it is an illustration of a person and if there's anything that matters to me, it's that audiences see illustrations of people that are real and aren't, you know, some factory constructed, idealized version of people. Because I think we're insanely 
wondrous as we are. And part of the responsibility of storytelling is to remind people of that. Now, do you get offers a lot now or do you still have to audition? I'd say it's probably 70% offers, 30% audition. And what I get offered a lot is series. And once you're on a series, you, you know, you're, you're for the most part off the market. So, um, but if and when I have to, I audition. I don't like it, but I'm happy to do it because, uh, there's a big long line of people who audition. Why shouldn't I be in that line too? Right. Now, then, now, now, a few of your show in between your your resume, you have a few uh, sitcoms uh, mixed in there, comedies. Do those? Do you have to audition for usually, or do people know your work and call you in? Parks and Rec, Modern Family, and The Office. Those were all offers. So was Brooklyn Nine Nine. And I'd like to do more of that. What's... I mean, I, I'm so much more comfortable doing that. Well, what's the difference feeling on the set? Because, you know, you, you see these shows and they're all, the shows you're on are all, you know, major league shows, like creme de la creme. What's it like coming on a set where it is more loose, even though it's professional, than when you have an intense character in your other shows? It's intimidating for me because that, that comedy tempo is so different, you know, from what I'm used to. And they're all so good at it. You know, take those shows I just mentioned, it's like, that's the Hall of Fame, you know? Um, but um, I, you know, you adjust and you you can feel when people are surprised that you're funny. Um, and why wouldn't they be? I mean, because they, they, you know, when you've seen some, all the crazy shit I've done on TV. Um, but I love those things. I would do one of those things in two seconds. One of those like single camera, because those are all single camera comedies, which allow for, I think, a little more irony and a little more playing against, you know, the comedy rhythm. The, the half hour multicam thing, that I've, I've never really been able to do. Okay. But I, I would. I mean, I'd try it, but. Now, what, another... what's coming up in your future? What do you have coming? Well, my immediate future, which is going to mean I have to get off the phone soon, is I have to go to my trainer because I'm putting on a shitload of weight to play a wrestler. Um, I don't think anybody knows this yet. Um, in a series called Heels for Stars that is about uh, a little wrestling league in, the, in South Georgia. And um, that starts shooting April 1st. Um, I gotta go out there in a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, since early January, I uh, have been training to learn how to wrestle and look like I know how to wrestle, <laughs> which has been amazing. It's been a lot of fun. I'm a huge wrestling fan, so it's an incredible opportunity to do this show. Um, and I'm going to be on a couple of homelands this season. And I shot a film in the fall called The Little Things with Denzel Washington and Rami Malek. Um, that's a Warner Brothers uh, movie that's coming out, I think, early 2021. And, um, you know, it's a full plate. I look at that and I'm like, well... Straight up, every time I start a job, back to that idea of the clean slate, I do not feel like a pro. I do not feel like I know what I'm doing. I do not have a sense of what's going to happen. And it's scary. But that's good. So, you know, that's, yeah, why, that's, why, that's, mean, that's why you bring it. That's why you bring it to the house every time. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I can't really be in any other place. And... I don't know if you still do stand up, but I would imagine any time. I mean, you and I, I think, would both understand that 
when you hear somebody say your name, say in your case, or, you know, I'm doing a play and the cue light goes off, you cross that threshold where three steps ago, you were behind a curtain or around a corner, and now you're standing in front of however many people. And nothing happens until you start the scene or you start your act or whatever. That moment is the greatest mix of fear and ecstasy and adrenaline and concentration and purpose that I know. I live for that moment. So you know, the beginning of things is always incredibly exciting. I just feel so grateful that I get to do a job where I can have that experience over and over and over and never get the chance to fall into some hypnotized state where I think I know what I'm doing because I'd be wrong. Well, that's awesome, man. You know, I, I, I want to. I know you have to get out of here. I, I want to take. I want to thank you for coming on. You know, we we had talked about it on uh, Facebook. And uh, now, are you on Twitter or what's your social media like? Yeah, I'm on there, but I don't. Uh, I'm more of a lurker than a uh, <laughs> participant. Okay. Occasionally, occasionally I jump on. I like Instagram because it's a good way to uh, keep people apprised of your work. Um, but I don't know. The whole thing scares me a little bit. All right. Well, you know what? People, do me a favor. Go to IMDb. Look up Chris Bauer. Uh, the one was on my show, not the other ones he has worked with. <laughs> and sit there and go through. And if you haven't watched The Wire, watch it. If you haven't watched True Blood, watch it. If you haven't watched The Deuce, which I was the moron that didn't watch it, watch it. It'll blow your socks off. So, people, check Chris Bauer out. Go to my website. I have over 750 episodes. That's www.coopertalk.net. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. Twitter at Cooper Talk, Instagram at Cooper Talk One. And remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.